thank you. Uh, I think I'm a bit speechless. <laughs> All this uh, boomerang of legal challenges and uh, the, the last question is this, is the court the way to go? I guess it's a very heavy handed question. Um, there must be other questions burning from the floor and I guess it's a time to open the floor for the questions. Uh, our guest speakers are here, um, willing to take your questions. Um, we will take three or five questions at each round. We will address it and then we will go for the next round. We have enough time, fortunately. Um, we would invite now um, anybody to come forward to the mic, um, introduce briefly themselves and also be as uh, brief as possible on the questions. Comments are allowed, but also please be brief as much as possible. Um, open uh, the floor for the questions now. Yeah, John. My question is to anybody on the panel because uh, maybe it's a more academic type question, but it can be applied to every case in my mind at least. If we have levels of reality in the country, levels of reality, for instance, federation is one reality. The Federation of Malaya, Malaysia is made up of three states today, Sabah, Sarawak, and Malaya. It's one level of reality. Then we have a second level of reality, nine states of the Federation, or 11 states of the Federation of Malaya, second level of reality. My question is this, when the, uh, when the federal constitution says Islam is the religion of the federation, isn't it talking about the highest level of reality, which means as three partners, Sabah, Sarawak, and Malaya, created the laws that agreed and formed Malaysia in 1963. Another level is state senates, okay? And in the level of state states, we have 13, if not 14 states now, with federal territory as the 14th. If you give that status, it's not formal. So my question is, when we keep talking about the federal level and the state level, it can be confusing in the interpretation of what we mean by the religion of the federation and the freedom of practice in a practical everyday sense because religion is one set of words. Here we talk about reason and faith. Faith in my definition is always personal. My faith cannot be dictated by my father, for example, my late father, cannot. My faith is personal to me. Religion, he can say, John, you are born to me, your mommy and I believe something, that's your religion, I, I can accept that. But faith is always a personal matter. So my question is, in interpreting these big words and ideas of, at the level of world of ideas, when we apply it to personal level, can we just juxtapose dif different meanings and implications and thereby confuse our own comprehension of it? Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Haikal and I have a question, a general question that I would like to address to all speakers, any speakers. Um, with things that are alarming currently when they are getting more radical, when we are coming up with more discussions, dialogues and opinions to get things better, what is your opinion? Uh, what awaits us at the end of the tunnel? Are these changes will be for better or for worse? And considering our political, economic status and freedom in academia. So, thank you. That was my question. Hello, my name is Iqbal. I'm from Chili Sauce. I just wanted to raise a point that each of you had uh, mentioned earlier, which was the whole excuse that keeps getting used. Yaitu, um, we want to censor certain things because we don't want to confuse people. So that keeps getting used, and as Professor Zarom just now you mentioned, that comes across as quite condescending. So I want to ask why that excuse flies as often as it does. Who is it that's getting confused? What do orang kampung think? Do they feel that their iman is so weak that the Allah word getting used by Catholics threatens their way of life? I don't understand that point. If you could give me some insight on that. 
Go ahead. Um, Azrom or Kaleb, uh, just a question firstly to Prof Zarum. Um, uh, Deputy Minister in the Prime Minister's Department, uh, Ashraf Wajdi Dusuki, just a few days ago reaffirmed the commitment of the government in basically establishing Malaysia as Islamic State. And this is a, a position that's been repeated time and time again. Uh, we've said it in the past that it was really a political decision, but we now see a much more structured, organized approach to it with, with cabinet level subcommittees and uh, Jakim, Jais and religious departments all working towards, you know, establishing that, working with political parties like PAS, for example, to get Hudud law put into the books and so forth. So uh, my question is, is, is this something that we really should uh, take seriously? As some people have been able to say that actually Malaysia, we don't worry about it, we will always be a secular state, this is all politics, or should we really uh, deal with it in an organized and, and confrontational manner? Uh, just a second question. Uh, a lot of people have been asking me, and this goes to uh, Datin Paduka Marina, is that, you know, a lot of these things affect Malay Muslims in this country. Where are they? Where are their voices? Uh, this has been um, a very insulting, paternalistic, and uh, it compels Muslims to shut up and just do whatever we tell you. And it seems that uh, Malay Muslims are just, you know, li lying down and just taking it and just doing whatever they're telling you to do. So. The, the silent majority amongst Malay Muslims is very much there. People are asking me, where are they? Why shouldn't they speak out? Why are they not speaking out? Thank you. Um, right. Actually, KJ, it's not particularly confusing. Um, because, I mean, it, it, I suppose it's confusing in the sense that you said Islam's religion, the federation, and yet you have Islamic laws in the different states. Okay. I think that Article 3 is more symbolic than anything else. The, what is clear is that legislation is in the hands of the state legislature. Right? And what you can make legislation on is also clarified very clearly in Schedule 9. Okay? Um, so the, the state-federal dichotomy shouldn't really be an issue. Because I, like I said, I think Article 3 is, is primarily symbolic, which is what the Supreme Court in Che Omar Che So also you know, was leaning towards that as well. The, 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 the reality is that when you have actual laws, it would be at the state level. But those laws are limited by what is in Schedule 9 and also should be limited by what is in the rest of the Constitution. And I think for the longest time, that was the case. Yeah? Because in the case of Jamal Adin Osman, when the, when the young man was arrested under ISA because he was a born a Muslim but became a Christian, the court said, no, hold on. Article 11 says he has freedom of religion. Let him go. So there was a point when our courts were actually pretty awesome. I mean, not all the time, but you know, there, there, you know, there was moments of awesomeness. Um, uh, hi, Carl. Where are you, dude? What awaits us at the end of the tunnel? I don't know, man. Um, you see, what worries me is that on these issues, uh, none of the political parties are willing to stand up really strong on it. Okay, so we don't really have, a, uh, you know, we, I mean, we don't really have a clear cut. Uh, choice where you know the, the political parties, uh, you know, will they uh, apart from the DAP, but then they are kind of like the DAP, right? <laughs> what we need is the Amanas, the PKR, and what's the name of your dad's party? Bersatu. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All these new parties keep popping up. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't resist. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, 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 yeah, this is why I never get invited to parties. Um, right, okay, so, um, so uh, <laughs> we need the Malay or Malay majority parties to be able to say, look, no, we cannot allow this to continue. Yeah. But they won't do it because there's a concern that it's political suicide. Because, you know, look, as soon as you say anything, you know, like this, this, this RU355, you know, if you don't support it, you are murtad. Automatically, you know, this anti-intellectual thing, you, do, you don't support me, you're going to go to hell. I didn't know when on earth Hadi was given that power. <laughs> All right, when did God send Gabriel down to Trungadu to give him <laughs> that power? All right, okay, so, uh, but do you see what I'm saying? The discourse is such, it's very, very crude. And the political parties are nervous to make a strong stand. So, but if you don't make a strong stand, how are you, you going to change things? 
You know, so I, I, my sense is that unless we, and when I say we, and I'm very, very sorry to, to do it this way, all right, f unless we Malay Muslims on the ground say, no, look, dude, I don't want to live like this, it's not going to change. Because the political party will, will always go. <laughs> and I think they, they tried, yes, it's, it's Jais here. Uh, um, do you know what I'm saying? Unless we make it, a, we, unless we make intellectual freedom an, a political issue where you will get our support, they, they're not going to really care because politicians always go to where they're going to get the support and they're worried about dealing with this kind of stuff. All right, um, there's a guy, uh, Iqbal from Chili Sauce. Where are you, dude? Right, it's a it's an online magazine newspaper. They're awful, you know, because <laughs> they dressed me up as a woman once, and uh, and they photoshopped me as a woman, and they, they, I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it was a T-shirt. It was horrible. It was like, and, and, no, the thing is, I don't mind being photoshopped as a woman, but an attractive woman, lah. I was I was I was a hideous woman. Um, dude, they never explain. Confuse people against public order, against national security, they never ever explain. They just use the words, okay? Our government thinks that they're living in Hogwarts. <laughs> if you use the correct magic word, things will just happen, right? So, excruciato, Bobby Wanda! <laughs> you know, they never ever explain. You look at the, the books which are banned, they, they give this vague, but what, what they're doing is they're just taking words from the constitution and then just putting it there. It's against public order. It's against national security. You know, it, it, uh, it, or, or they say, oh, it, it's going to confuse people. Where's the evidence that it confuse people? They never show it. And you can see that in the history of book banning in this country, where actually even the courts say that if the minister is of the opinion that there could be some of these problems, and as long as he had spoken to the right people, it doesn't matter if these right people have been giving him absolute barracks, right? As long as he's done that, then it's okay, it's done, it's cool. So there is no need to prove that there is a threat to public order. There is no need to prove that all these poor Muslims are going around in a confused state of terror. They'll just say it and they'll use it, and it's just like Harry Potter, it works every single time. Um, yeah, uh, um, chili sauce, uh, it's not made caricatures, caricatures of me, but I do have your bottle of chili sauce, I haven't dared try it yet. Um, yeah, why do people accept this really con condescending, patronizing, insulting excuses? I mean, like, like the CIS book, you know, we were reasons given were that the book is inclined towards confusing the Muslim community, especially women. Anywhere else, I think women would riot um, because it's so insulting uh, to us. But no, they accept, uh, at least one section of women just simply accept that they are easily confused. Uh, similarly, about um, the other statements about how it would confuse the uh, Muslim community, especially those who have shallow religious beliefs. Well, there must be a lot of people who really do agree that they have shallow religious beliefs. And in fact, I, actually, I think that's quite accurate uh, for one thing. I think a lot of people do have shallow uh, religious beliefs, um, and they're quite happy most of the time that way. Um, but they also tend, there's a tendency to ex excuse themselves by saying, well, I don't know anything about religion, so, but, you know. So they're already confirming again, over and over again, that yes, they are that, that group of people that these people are appealing to, you dumb people with shallow uh, religious beliefs. But we have to ask the question, why, when you have Jakim with one billion um, uh, budget, uh, why do people have shallow religious beliefs? You know, I would think we would have one billion worth of beliefs, uh, uh, which should be quite deep. Uh, but no, we're not. So um, yeah, it's it's a funny funny phenomenon. Um, the other thing is about one of the, the first issues that that CIS worked on is whether Muslim men can beat 
their wives. And um, there was a lot of, you know, like, um, the, the way it's, it's done uh, against us is that, you know, men are predatory, men are beasts, men are, any, and men accept it. So, I don't know, it's all coming to roost now, by the way, starting with Harvey Weinstein, it's, right, so, you know, uh, think about that. Um, and the other thing is about where are the Malay Muslims? We are here, that's us. Um, there's G25, which I tackles exactly uh, these questions and are quite brave about it, I think. Um, but yeah, when it comes to religion, uh, people are very quiet, very afraid, and with reason, because they've seen what happens to people who actually speak out. Uh, look at poor Arwah Qasim Ahmad and what they did to him. Uh, amazing. Uh, and so if you see that, and you know that you don't have even half the intellectual power of Qasim Ahmad, you cannot argue, you don't have that knowledge, you know, worse things are going to happen to you. So that's, that's why uh, people are quiet. And, and you know, you see numerous surveys like, do you want more Islamic law? Yes. Uh, I just saw a survey of young Muslim women like, um, do you pray five times a day? It's like 100% yes. Uh, <laughs> you know, those are the politically correct and safe answers because even if you say, well, maybe four, sometimes, four times, you're going to get done for that one time that you didn't. Um, and that's the, the nature of it, whether it is the force of authority or you're going to get you know, dragged over the hot coals on social media. We've seen this happen so many times. And as you know, uh, nobody up there uh, says anything, which means that basically allows these things to carry on, carry on with impunity. What happened in the past few weeks with Zamihan is unusual, very unusual that he actually got slapped down, um, not by the people that should be doing it, but by uh, other, other leaders, the rulers. Um, that's actually an aberration to the norm. So for most people, it is scary, uh, and that's why. But yes, but we, we need them to speak out. It's not that they agree with all these things that are happening, I think. Uh, because I, I speak like this to many groups of people. I've, I've never had people walk out or scream at me or anything. Uh, people know, <laughs> you know, and I don't choose the audience, so, you know, it could be anywhere. Um, but, you know, the, this climate of fear, which is being inculcated, being nurtured, being encouraged, being promoted by, you know, who, um, is, is what's doing it. So, I think it needs a few people you know, maybe different people from the usual, not us lot who are always doing this, to come out and say enough is enough. I mean, if you look at the, the sexual harassment case, this Harvey Weinstein case, what it has set off is an incredible wave globally of women finally coming out to say uh, that yes, this has been happening all this time because someone finally said enough is enough. So. We have to get to that point, that enough is enough point, and really, you know, you know, maybe hashtag enough is enough, I don't know. Uh, otherwise, you know, 10 years down the line, uh, you know, it looks pretty bleak from this point of view. But I suppose we, we could do something to change it if we wanted to. But it means, you know, saying to ourselves, well, well, you know, we'll sacrifice whatever. Yeah. I'll try to answer some of them. Uh, hi, Carl. What awaits us at the end of the tunnel? I think we, we have to decide what awaits us at the end of the tunnel. I think we shouldn't wait for what could be at the end of the tunnel. We have to decide. Uh, and this is related to Azrul's point. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, if we feel that really uh, 
the walls are closing in, in the sense that our rights are being uh, reduced day by day, and I believe that is true. Uh, your Azrul asks, is this something we should take seriously? I think this is something we should have taken seriously a long time ago. Yeah? I think we've been too complacent. Uh, we've been feeling that, and, and many still feel that, for example, uh, RU355 will not affect non-Muslims. I think that's, that's nonsense. It will affect the whole of Malaysia, and I think we should be aware of those possibilities and uh, that uh, will become probabilities in a sense. Yeah? And, uh, uh, so I'm not I'm not terribly uh, optimistic about things, but I think at the end of the day we have to take uh, to make the decisions. We have to em empower ourselves, I guess, uh, and that means uh, not only providing support for uh, the, the people who you feel are fighting for you, but to actually join the battle, as it were. Yeah, uh, that's the only way that we can reclaim our country. I feel. Yeah. Stuff, but it has to be done, yeah. Uh, and it can be done in so many different ways uh, by actually voicing your opinions rather than keeping quiet and just, you know, liking people's comments on Facebook, for example. I think uh, one should go further than that. So, uh, uh, is there something? Is this something we should take seriously as well? I'll say I'll, re I'll re re reiterate. Yes, I think we, sh we should take this seriously. Um, the Malay Muslim voices. I agree with both. Uh, as me and Marina, that uh, yeah, they're, they're, they're quiet at the moment, P partly through socialization, I feel, uh, uh, partly through a kind of uh, this uh, kind of siege mentality, yeah, that uh, somehow the use of race and religion, the rhetoric around race and religion has uh, made many uh, in the Malay community, I feel, uh, afraid to speak out, yeah. Uh, and I think some of the, uh, the polls that have been done uh, uh, have, have indicated that. Yeah. Also, I think uh, there is this thing about media depiction. Yeah? Uh, media, uh, whether we like it or not, especially media of Utusan Malaysia, Berita Harian, TV3, which are more prevalent, in, uh, more, more dominant in the, in the, in the, uh, in the rural areas, uh, provide a skewed, uh, a warped version of Malaysia, but nonetheless, uh, it is a version that, that is dominant. Yeah? And I think uh, that needs to be taken into account. Yeah? Siege mentality, insular siege mentality, and of course, shallow beliefs. Yeah? Uh, certainly, over the years, uh, and even now, when you know, uh, the emphasis is on, for example, uh, memorizing the Quran rather than uh, looking at the meanings uh, that are there in the Quran and trying to understand the Quran. The emphasis is in there. Yeah? Many of the Pondok schools are like that. So given that, I think uh, there are a lot of problems, but they're not insurmountable. Like I said, it depends very, very much, very much on all of us, not only Muslims, M Malaysian, Muslim, Muslim, Malaysians, but Malaysians generally. Thank you. Uh, let me just add a bit. I, I think the major problem is you, we, we will always speak our minds whenever, wherever we are. And people see us as troublemakers rather than actually, actually trying to make a change. Problem is, you should see it as, a, as your right to listen. Don't see it as our right to speak. So unless you, you, you voice out your own right, this is, uh, that you have a right to, uh, to listen to different opinions so you can make an informed decision. Stop this idea, this manufacturing of consent, painting us all, all as, uh, as a, a, a small group of people who are just some, somehow some strange fringe group who have all these weird ideas or Western ideas. Of course, right. So uh, although everybody seems to watch Western movies, but uh, Western ideas are fine. So why don't you feel insulted that your right is being taken away? So this, this, this whole idea, this, you know, the majority, the silent majority, don't seem to be, they, they don't seem to realize that their right is being taken away. They just see us as a fringe group who was uh, shouting, uh, why are they shouting? And this, this, this Malay idea of Tola Ansu, always the idea of somehow trying to compromise and sweep everything under the rug. Let's find some sort of uh, compromise solution. Let's not just, you know. Uh, we live in a very changing world, and if you've got no new ideas, and you're not willing to take, uh, take on the world as it is, and if, if you just want to compromise, you're not going to survive in the next generation. It's your, it's your generation actually is going to suffer the most. Uh, as, as I think this, trying, this idea, trying to make everybody compromise, uh, to, uh, trying to make everybody almost, you know, even universities have become like, we're trying to become a factory. We're producing uh, graduates who are just, 
you know, they know this stuff, but they, they can't think. So how are they going to produce new ideas and face new challenges? So this, this manufacturing of consent that you have now will do you guys a great deal of harm, rather than, rather than us all fogies out here, so <laughs> we're too late to, to change anyway. 